Bubble presents the No Code Hustle, where we speak with founders, builders, and makers who are building the next generation of tech products all without code. I'm your host, Eric Israni. Welcome, everyone. I'm here with Shane Anastasi, CEO of Metasphere. Thanks for coming on the show, Shane. Hey, not a problem, Eric. Thanks for having me. So let's kick it off by talking about your app a little bit. Why don't you tell me a little something about Metasphere and, and what you're building? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it's quite a, an interesting history in how we got to Metasphere in that you know I've been a bubble uh, user and advocate for maybe four or five years. And it really started with uh, the current company or another company that, that I own called PS Principles. And we were looking to build something that allowed us to facilitate a training and certification uh, for the professional services industry. And that eventually, as it grew, evolved into kind of a solution of its own that we could use for any skill or any uh, something that we wanted to teach. Uh, and so that has become Metasphere. And essentially, what Metasphere is, is a different way to look at the uh, development of skills within an organization at scale. And it's a very uh, untraditional approach in comparison to say something like a learning management system uh, that, and focuses primarily on driving activities in the field as opposed to trying to distribute content. And uh, not that we don't distribute content, that is a part of it, but the real focus is in how do we drive activities and how do we have those activities reviewed by a subject matter expert in order to approve that the learning has happened. Okay. so. Give us a use case for that. What is wh- who's currently using this, and, and what are they trying to teach their employees? Absolutely. Uh, so, so we started doing this with professional services, uh, but but the first customer that really came to us that said, "Hey, look, I love this approach that you're doing. Could you build me a generic platform?" They had the idea of wanting to teach customer success managers, and uh, they had 250 customer success managers in 116 cities across the globe. And they wanted to facilitate a change or transformation from uh, technical service management to customer facing customer success advocates. And so uh, we've just were at the end of kind of that initial rotation where we've literally uh, moved all of them through the first stage of, of becoming customer success managers, which is the consumption of the content, but also the completion of field based activities that have them put that content into practice. And that now comes to us during phase one because we're the experts in this field. But then what we're in the middle of doing now is transitioning the system so that it now becomes the employee's manager or somebody else in the company that's a subject matter expert in a particular field. The idea of the system is that it can do any or all of those approaches based on what's best given the kind of skill that we want to teach. We could be teaching sales, how to sell a particular kind of selling. It could be challenger sales. It could be, uh, you know, uh, any kind of approach. Uh, It's whatever the skill is that we want to teach the field. And what we do as a company is help you, we give you a solution that boils that skill down to actions. And then we help you monitor and facilitate those actions in the real world. So you've developed this proprietary method of getting people up to speed and it sounds like you're taking you're able to take several hundred people and transition them into a new job at at a level unprecedented like the people weren't transitioning jobs like this this quickly previously yeah that's exactly what the goal has been so although we started off really trying to hone the learning process that's kind of how this started but of course to run the industry certification body that we wanted to set up we wanted to do something that people hadn't done before. And that was to focus on really earning the certificate. So the whole idea was we could take, and I don't want to point fingers at other industry bodies, but you know, we could take the approach that's typically done, which is, did you consume the content? Convince me you consumed the content and now make up some artifact that says, I think that you're using it in the field. And the reality is that those certifications don't really prove that you've really learned any skill at all. And for customer facing consultants, what I wanted to do was I wanted to find a way not just to scale it for myself as as I was the executive of a services firm uh, and the CEO of a consulting company, but really what I wanted to do was to be able to help facilitate within the industry thousands and thousands of consultants getting a certification that we could actually verify. 
And so we had to find a way to change the learning process or to, to uh, within a systematic format but we also had to find a way to distribute the knowledge that we had as an industry so that we could at scale really kind of facilitate and approve these skills as they're learned in the field. So, you know, right now, uh, you know, on top of other things that I do, uh, I'm actually overseeing about 1,300 consultants and the activities that they do in the field at scale. 1,300 people all interacting yes. with your platform right now. The first initial one, the PS yeah. principles one, yeah, absolutely. And then what we're doing with Metasphere is we're adding more and more to that. But of course, the the interaction now is occurring between the employee and the employer more than it is between the employee and us. So, okay. on the industry based certification, yeah, there's thirteen hundred, maybe fourteen hundred consultants interacting with the site on an ongoing basis, and we're able to facilitate and oversee the actions that they submit and give them feedback say hey look yeah that's a really good idea but did you think of it from this perspective or from this angle um, maybe it didn't work this time uh, and so that's so the way the system works is that we're not trying to get you to prove that you were successful because success is irrelevant when it comes to learning experience so mm -hmm. sometimes a failure is just as much uh, experience and learning experience than getting successes and so the idea is that even if somebody submits a failure or an attempt to do something and they didn't work or it didn't work, that doesn't mean that that's a lost opportunity to learn. So it's still approved as a learning opportunity. And so, so me, what happens, yep. Yeah, so let me break it down a little bit. So what I'm hearing is that you've created the first product that it was called PS. PS, PS principles, yep. PS principles. So the first product, you have 1,300 people on there, and what you've done is you've invited them to come take this proprietary learning challenge, the proprietary learning course, where they go yep. through action by action. They submit what they've done to you, the body of that certifies, and as long as they complete all these things, they then get the certification at the end, but you know that they have the knowledge because they've demonstrated it. And That's then right. And 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 so now it's a, it's, a, it's a certification that says I can certify that this person has had this experience in the field. And that's what we can't certify with most other certifications, mm -hmm. right? So if yeah. I get a project manager and that project manager is certified, I can't certify that they've had to go tell a client that they're not going to get what they thought they were going to get mm -hmm. for the budget that they had, because that's the most difficult conversation. Sure. So what we have is we would have a step that says, prove to me that you've had to do this and how you applied or didn't apply the theories that we're teaching you and put them into practice. And so that's, that's the, the difference that we're able to bring to the, to the process. So you remove a lot of the unknowns about the certification processes that currently exist by creating something that is, you know, like it's a lot more robust and you know exactly what you're getting. Yeah. It's evidence-based. Yeah. And, and so what you did with that then is you took this battle tested platform and now you're opening it up to other style not other styles other content other yeah, types yeah. of learning so that you're replacing yourself on the certification side and you're inviting different users so a company can come in and be like i want to teach like you said customer success to all of my people yep. they, they put them in the funnel and they just got to add the content to the process you've already created the scaffold you've created that's exactly right. And, and because we focus on actions, what we've been able to do is to create content flexibility. So what that means is that we're not worried about SCORM compliance. We're not worried about tin can APIs. What we're really worried about is that do you already have the content somewhere in your organization? Let's facilitate the series of actions you want people to take. And that becomes the focus. And what that also means is that we're able to provide just in time training. So if I'm going to ask you to go do a particular action in the field, then maybe the only piece of information I need to give you is the piece of information that relates specifically to that action. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get you to consume six hours of training to go do one thing and then to forget 90% of it. <laughs> Let's break the training up so that the training matches the action. Yeah. And so now I can say to you, here, consume this, go do that and tell me how it went. And, and by doing that, what we're doing is, is not only doing a better job of validating that people have learned a skill, but we're also accelerating the end result because now people know exactly what that next step is that they're doing in the field. And, and really what we're doing with Metasphere is, is it's just a software platform. Mm -hmm. And so it's entirely up to, to you what you teach with it. And one of the things that we've learned through now talking with clients, but 
you know, not only is are we able to help them identify the things that we could get, uh, that we could put together that could teach them, we're finding that there are other vendors that have content that we could teach them, uh, and they also have content that they could teach their customers. So as an example, you could use this for Bubble to teach people how to use Bubble, yeah. right? And you, you step them through, right? So you guys have the tutorials inside of the program, but think of it now saying, okay, for you to be level one, you would have to have done this with a repeating group. You mm -hmm. would have to have done this with uh, workflow. And once you've done that, submit something to us so that we can see it. Oh yeah, you have done it. That looks really good. Hey, next time what you should look at is, you know, declaring this in a different way. That's the feedback that you get as the individual. But now at least I know that I've earned a certain status inside of the program. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how it works. It's, it's really about altering the way that we look at skills development in, in the world. I can think of a, a lot of different things that I want to see people know how to do in bubble before I would certify them. That would be fantastic. Um, so before we, before we take a look at your app, let's take a step back. Tell me how you got to this point. Give me a little bit of your history. Were you a developer? Yep. Were you a technologist? What were you doing before you start building on bubble? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm probably, I'd put myself more on the technologist path than maybe a, 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 a core developer. Uh, I, I went to, uh, you know, I went to university to do information technology. So obviously spent time developing there in, you know, C++ and, and different kind of languages. Kind of, uh, I boarded the transition from procedural to kind of object oriented uh, approaches. Uh, a lot of things looking at the, you know, databases and optimization and very technical stuff, network protocols, all that kind of stuff. But once I hit the, the, the real world, I worked for IBM and, and really did, did minimal to marginal actual development work. I was more of a solution architect. I kind of built solutions. I worked out how solutions talk to each other. So technology has never been a difficult thing and I've always understood how to develop but you know when you deal with real developers it's a different breed and a different activity right so you know that that's not me and, and i've never really had the hands-on experience to do that but of course i know how to get my hands dirty and get into stuff and so uh being you know involved in lots of software companies through my history everywhere from you know ibm salesforce uh, i helped build big machines vignette corporation you know software companies that have grown and been successful you know, I kind of have an idea of what it is that might be a good idea for a software product. And so, um, you know, about four years ago, five years ago, when I had the idea for the certification, the industry certification, I had to find a way to build it without spending a lot of money. And uh, I cannot tell you, Eric, how many uh, no code uh, languages or, or uh, solutions I looked at. I mean, seriously, like, I probably, I had a separate account that I created for myself, that's <laughs> email and all the demo stuff, all yeah. just, just, you know, because I couldn't afford to have that coming into my real email every day. And so uh, I was just testing them time and time and time again. And, you know, and it really, when it came down to what I could do the fastest with the most productivity and still have the flexibility that I wanted to do the things that I had in my head that I knew I could do as a developer, it really came down to to bubble and um you know i'm not gonna sit here and say it's perfect but but you know i can tell you that when i, I looked at uh you know so many of these options uh it was clearly the fastest best option that i had available for me to try and build what i would declare something that's at least close to an enterprise product and you know the background that i have is not in you know part-time or piecemeal apps it's it's you know kind of world-class enterprise delivery that's got a sustained kind of, you know, rock solid uh, 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 scrutiny. So I, I give you an example, the solution that we'll show you today, uh, the organization that has uh, it in place had to put us through a very serious um, uh, vulnerability test. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we went through ImmunaWeb and kind of, you know, ratcheted up the system to, to threat analysis and, and bombarded it with a whole bunch of, you know, kind of, you know, attacks and all that kind of stuff and you know we passed with flying colors we found a couple things that i worked with your guys on i, I got a awesome. huge cue to um um one of the founders Haas. what's his first name gosh yeah josh oh my goodness man just you know working with josh and you know we laid out what we were doing we laid out what the customer wanted to achieve and you know josh was just awesome at being completely open book like yep we absolutely get behind this stuff put it through its paces tell us what you found out we found a couple of really minor things. Josh was all over it. We had him rectified in like, you know, 
couple of days. We took that back to the client. Um, client was super happy and, you know, really one of the first kind of, you know, small vendors. You know, these guys work with SAP and HP and all that kind of stuff, but we're really one of the first vendors that went through with flying colors through the, through the vulnerability tests. So, you know, to me, that's, that's the thing that I'm looking at. I'm looking at, is this thing robust? Is it going to stay up 24-7? Is it going to be close to five nines? availability and, and can we really rely on the database and like i said i'm not gonna say everything's perfect uh but but you know you look at that in comparison of what's available for for options for people like that in the marketplace and to mm -hmm. me you know bubble stands head and shoulders above whatever else i could find at the time ah, i love to hear it and i and i'm sure it'll continue to be so big shout out to my team they do a great job and it also yeah, highlights support guys eve on the support I, I gotta tell i'm sure they think i'm a pain in the butt but you know it's it's like we our clients are very demanding and so we want to make sure that in, in using the platform that the platforms is as strong as as you know uh, as it can be because i mean really what what you got the underpinning to our business models mm -hmm. and so you know that's the thing that you know keeps me up at night is is making sure that i'm comfortable that, that you know bubble has their stack together and working and and you know thus far it's been great i'm happy to hear it and that highlights one of the best things about bubble that I think a lot of people don't think about when they get into building. There's a whole DevOps side of things that we take off your plate. You don't have to worry about those things, the managing the servers, the uptime, the making sure everything's in compliance, the encryptions on your servers. We make sure everything is always industry standard or better for everything. So you don't have to worry about yeah, those yeah. kind of things. And if we're not up to where you'd like to be, as you saw, we work very hard to make sure our our customers are happy and that they can build their businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that it is incumbent upon us as, um, you know, the guys using the platform to keep pushing bubble to say, here is what our customers are expecting. And so this is what we need from the platform because it's going to keep changing, right? Like mm. it, the, the world keeps moving from what is a, an acceptable style of application to an acceptable style of presentation. And, and we're going to keep having to push that and kind of keep a dialogue going that says, here is what that next step has to look like. Absolutely. And we appreciate it, right? Keep us on our toes and, and make sure we, we maintain our position as a leader in the industry. And yeah, right. <laughs> and so let's take a look at your app. Why don't you show us around a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. Let me, Let me show you what it looks like. Is. So the URL is, is um, uh, it's well, right now it's uh, metasphere.com. So www.metasphere.com. Uh, I'll be showing you a bit of a different background uh, for that, but that's exactly where we'd want people to go after uh, podcast here. Now, let me uh, get the screen share happening. Let me work out which uh, screen I wanted to show you first. Here we go. All right. Here we go. All right. Can you see that, Eric? I can. All right. So this is uh, what we call our skills development dashboard. So the whole, whole idea here is that as an individual learner, uh, you should know exactly what the next step is in developing a skill. Now, we can talk about you know, the kind of learning that we do. And one of the focuses that we like to actually take is let's stop trying to teach competencies. Um, a great example is we, we, the, the customer we're working with uh, here with the CSMs, the customer success managers, you know, their initial goal was they were going to teach every single person in their company 13 different competencies. And we kind of said, look, that, that's a waste of time, right? That's 13 different classes that you're going to just throw content at people and then not really know how to judge whether the competency had stuck, mm -hmm. right? We said, why don't you teach them? how to do their job. Why don't you teach them how to be customer success managers? Because that's more easily translated into action. Go grab a customer and do this, right? That's now the way that you would do it. So in here, you can actually see an example. We're working with uh, support services. So we have some content in here for support services, but you also see that this person has a number of different skills that they're working on. This is uh, Batman, Bruce Wayne here. He's got right. some, uh, some skills that he needs, uh, obviously, because fighting crime isn't enough. So what he's going to do is try to, you know, level out his skills. But he's got some other things he can do here. So 
maybe uh, he's on support services now, but maybe he wants to learn a little bit more about delivering customer success. So he can go across here and now you can see that it's updated for this particular skill. He's got some things that he's learning. He's already uh, submitted and approved step one. He has got to approve and submit uh, the next step, step two. He's got to submit that and get that approved by an SME. Now, this is a big part of the solution. Now, we'd like to think that, Eric, if you were my manager, that basically I could just submit everything to you and you would sign off on everything. Now, the problem is, is that the reality of the real world is that, you know, you're not an you're not an SME or an expert in everything. And what happens in most companies is the experts are all over the place. And in some instances, the expert is actually outside of the company. So the way that we built Metasphere was to accommodate for all of that. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we build the skills path. We build these logs. They're called skills cards. And each level of skill breaks down into skills cards. And each skills card is just one small step to being closer to developing that skill. Okay. Now what happens? Yep. Yeah. So I just want to, for people who are listening and not necessarily watching, what I'm looking at here is a dashboard and you have a, a bar across the top of this dashboard with all the different things pertaining to the individual user. And then we have a couple of groups below it. On the left here, you have your skills list, which is a list of all the skills cards that we're talking about, each card being an action. Um, what's, what do we have here in the middle? We have a, an the onboarding that, that's the detail that's the detail for the skills card so okay. here we've we've clicked on onboarding best practices yeah. right so so that's something that we want that's right so that's yeah. something we want a customer success manager to do right to make sure that they understand how to onboard a client mm -hmm. so the first step that this skills card focuses on is clarifying their understanding of onboarding effectiveness right and we talk about within this, how do you show that there is onboarding effectiveness? And so now this skills card asks you to go do that. And so when you're ready to do it, when you're ready to kind of do that, first of all, you might want to consume some content. So you see the little uh, hat here. Yeah. Is, uh, the hat kind of means that there's some training content that goes along with this activity. And that takes you to a player. And that player will either give you a video or it will give you a PDF or it will give you whatever the material is that you need to consume in order to complete the action. As you can see here, we've just got a PDF that gives you a case study, and the case study is going to illustrate the things that you're going to need to put it into practice to do this step. And so once you've consumed that, that allows you then to go and try to carry out the step. Now, one of the things that we put in place is the idea that of cognitive journaling. So the idea of cognitive journaling is that when I do something and then I write about it, I create a connection in my brain that helps me learn better. And so it's used in therapy. It's used in many aspects of the world other than training and development. But hey, why not in training and development? And so what we do here is we take this skills card and we log an experience. And by logging an experience, we're able to kind of type in my experience. And by typing it in and reflecting on it, I'm now helping myself learn. And by doing that, that's what happens and now I submit that for approval. Now the approval, like I said, might be to my manager, might be to a subject matter expert somewhere else in the company. Now, what's really important about our system is first of all, we have to learn while the learners learn. So how we do that is every time somebody fills out a skills card, they have to answer one simple question. In the context of this program, was this exercise or this experience of value? And so what we're doing is we're getting feedback from the learners. We don't force them into yes, no. We say yes, no, and undecided. And we do that for a very particular reason. Is when we look at our totals, when we're doing analysis, we mm -hmm. want to make sure that the skills cards have a very, very high approval rate. Right? We want to make sure that we're in the kind of 90 plus percent for yeses and that no's and undecideds never add up to any more than 10%. Because that means we're off, we're off on la la land. People are not liking this 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 exercise. They think that it's worthless. We have to be good at what we're we're doing. And we've learned with some of our skills cards that we're actually a little bit off. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as we identify a skills card that's sub ninety percent yes, what happens then is we we get in and we rewrite it, and we go back to the customer and we say, hey, look, people are not learning from this exercise. Mm -hmm. Let's try and come up with something that's a little bit better. So this person will answer. They'll say, yes, I thought it was, a, and then I'll submit that. Now, they get a recognition because they've submitted it, yep. but now what happens is it now goes to their manager for approval, and it'll either go to their manager for approval or it will go to an SME. 
And so now what I have is the ability to kind of do this over and over and over again, continue the skills path, because now I know that the next thing that I want to do is step number four. That's the next step for me in my process. So the whole idea here is facilitating the learning process. A couple other things that we do. One of the things that we know works really well for learning is the ability to give recognition. Uh, I used to work for a gamification company uh, when that was the, the, the hot thing that was growing only to find out that companies didn't want to buy it as a mission critical system. And the reason for that is that once you gamify stuff, you have to make sure that you also continue to manage the game. So unless you're actually a game manufacturer, you don't really have somebody on hand who's going to keep changing the game so that the game becomes interesting. You know, we, we don't gamify the idea of recognition. We just make it very purely and simply a part of the program. You'll see down here, the eighth step in this level is to actually give recognition to other people. And it's not gamed. It's not, hey, you get certain points or certain things. You do it because it's a good thing to do. Now, recognition is very important in the learning process for two reasons. One, it makes me as the giver take the framework and put the framework into the real world. Now, by doing that, I'm actually thinking about the framework. Like I'm actually taking the framework and I'm putting it over the, what I'm watching Eric do. And if I see Eric deliver something that's in the framework, that's a good thing for me. That, that means I'm starting to recognize what the right behavior is. And so now I can give Eric a recognition and I can go into the system here and I can actually give a recognition to somebody and I'll say, I'll give this to John and I'll, I can say who else it needs to go to and so on. I can select the behaviors. Now, one of the good things that we've been able to do, Eric, is identify now, because I'm giving recognition, was this action that John followed, this thing that he did, was it a value to the company? Now, what we're tracking when we're doing that is we're starting to track the actual ROI of training. So we're actually able to build an ROI, which is something that companies have never been able to facilitate before. Sure. Was this training of value? What did I get from this training? And what we've got in our consultant certification program is we've got you know uh, customers getting hundreds of thousands of dollars of value from these behaviors on a yearly basis that they're able to walk back to their board and say here's why we're a part of this program and the ability to actually show our roi from training and development is something that's almost not done so yeah. so we're very happy to be able to do it and we do it through asking these questions during recognition these are things that we can assign value to we can say that we uh, avoided a reactive escalation. That's money in the bank if we do that. We can also say that there was a revenue impact this particular action. So now I write down what it was that I see. I can write that down and then I'll write that down and now I can actually send the recognition. Now, John, he gets a lovely email. He gets something that he got recognized. He feels good about himself. He's gonna do that action again. That's the second benefit of recognition. The fact that now John feels good about what he did. Yeah, I just I want to pause for a second and, and kind of break yep. down what we just talked about. So we have these skills cards, which they themselves have a lot of actions within them that tracks how you're doing. And it tracks not only how you're doing, but also how the system is working because you get a rating. And so you can you can see how successful this all is from both sides of the equation. Um, and then on the right here, I'm also seeing a live stream. So I watched you go through that last card, submit yep. that form, um, which by the way, I love the fact that you can actually justify what you're doing, the price that you might ask for the software because you'll have empirical data as to how much you save your users, how much you save yep. your clients. We've saved X amount of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. Because people are properly trained. But back to what I was I'm looking at here, you have this live stream on the right side of the dashboard showing what other people are doing, building in that social uh, that social reinforcement. And Absolutely. as soon as you hit that submit button, it actually popped up. John Porter was recognized by Bruce Wayne. And it looks yep. like you have a, a like system too. You have a thumbs up system built into yep. that. Yep. So, you know, and I think if you, ho if you hover on a recognition, what it does, it actually tells you what the recognition was so that I can actually read the story. And so the idea here is that, you know, I, might not know exactly uh, why 
uh, Bruce Wayne uh, recognized John. And so I'm sitting here and I'm like, oh, look at that. That's, that's something that I'm doing that now relates to me. Maybe I can do that. And what we've learned from recognition is, again, a third benefit of recognition is that maybe I'm not John or Bruce, but now I, I watch that uh, Bruce recognized John and I hear or I read what John actually did, that now creates another incentive for me to do the same behavior that John did because I realized that that's what this company recognizes. And so the whole idea of the habit loop and how the habit loop works within kind of psychology is kind of reinforced by what we call recognition. And so the whole idea is to get recognition as a part of the culture in a company helps everybody learn. But yeah, you're exactly right. The whole idea here is to engage people in learning in these activities so that they can continue to to do and become better at what they're trying to become better at. Now, the big change here, though, is that while we're doing this at the front end as individuals, what we're also doing is we're creating a lot of data that is pretty important. Now, that data, uh, we're here with Peter. Peter is actually Bruce Wayne's uh, manager. And you'll see here that under... Uh, here or under Bruce Wayne here are all the different activities that Bruce has submitted to me to do. Mm -hmm. And you'll see here that the system identifies for me the components of uh, the skills cards that I can approve as the manager. Now you'll see here the first one for Bruce, uh, level one, card number two, is not something that I can approve. And I can't approve it because I'm not an SME in this area, right? I'm not the expert. This has actually gone to the expert, but as the manager, I can still see it. Now, some of these things, they just need experience to be written in as a reflection. Some of them actually need a, a piece of evidence, so a document. And so we allow people to attach that evidence to the skills card so that if it goes to the subject matter expert, they can actually look at it. So you think about technical things, right? Things like architecture or sample code or whatever it might be, all of that can go with it. So as you can see now, the process begins to um, uh, facilitate. Now, an important part of the process here, see this thing called cycles? Yeah. What we're actually doing is we're checking how long we're tracking how many times it takes a person to get a skills card right. Now, what we're actually measuring now is learning efficiency. Is this person able to learn effectively over all of these skills cards? So if you look at it from a perspective of learning efficiency, to go through the whole level and do it with an average of one try per skills card that means i'm perfect every time i do a skills card i've got the concepts and i'm getting approved might be as soon too as it's easy. A, <laughs> that's right it might be too easy if that's the case if that's across everybody right yeah. so maybe we're asking right so so this idea of tracking the cycles gives us a data point that we've never had before which is learning efficiency and so what i'll show you if we look at the actual admin for this is you'll actually see that a lot of this data starts to pan out. This data starts to you know, show us how the team is doing from a learning perspective. It helps me identify people who need help. It helps let me know if people have actually learned and I can actually look at things like skills progress. Uh, what I can do in this part of the, the admin is I can actually see who has done what within my team. I know who's falling behind. I know who's keeping pace. I know who's doing things in the last time that they actually did a skill step. But what I can also do is I can measure engagement. And you can actually see here that I can track whether my team is engaging in the development of their skills. And so you've got I, four different kinds of charts here showing all these different data points that you've collected throughout the, the app. Absolutely. And here, Peter, this manager, he can look at his team's effectiveness. So his team's effectiveness and efficiency is 2.3. That's not very good. That means on average, to complete a skills card, his team is taking 2.3 attempts. Now that's because this is the test environment and we're always sending them back and testing out the cycle. But essentially anybody in the real world with the 2.3 would have to be looked at from a perspective of, hey, what are we doing wrong? Right? Now that's from a manager's perspective, looking at the manager's team. What we're able to do also is we're able to track the individuals for that manager in that team. And we created a nice little thing here in Bubble that you don't see a lot, but a very nice little kind of data filtering process. So we're looking at 30 days worth of data here. And if I want to, I can go back and make that a completely different period of data. That's now 117 days. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea with doing this is that we can quickly change the data period and have all the data reflected. 
Um, another thing that we've done very well within the system is this whole dashboard runs off of a data set. But that data set can actually be changed on the fly by changing the teams. So you can see here with kind of like the push of a button, we're actually able to rechange the data, set, have the data set reflect a different team, and then we can get different information given to the manager. So when it's an individual manager, the data is for all of the managers below that person. But if I switch across to uh, this view here, what we'll see in this view is that the data is for a particular team, the whole team unit. So what we might do in a global team is we might have uh, four regions. You might have APAC, uh, EMEA, Middle East, and the US or North America. Uh, you might have North America, South America, whatever it is. What we're able to do is actually do it by team and then change which team that I'm looking at really at the click of a button. Uh, you can see here when we're getting lots of users, we can easily change the time period again and turn it into something that's you know a lot broader, a lot more data can tell us uh, which learners are actually learning. This person was 1.2. This person was at you know a learning efficiency of one. And you can kind of see that as you go along, you can identify the people who are learning and the people that aren't. Yeah, since you know who you got to give a little extra attention to. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, that, and that's generally the idea of what it is that we're trying to do. We're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, which is to actually track the learning process and then respond. And what we found with uh, the, the customer success manager stuff that we're rolling out at the moment is our ability to respond to what's actually happening during the learning process mm -hmm. is incredible. We're able to change tact. We're able to emphasize certain points. We're able to change what it is that we're discussing with the groups. We can actually put a much finer point on how we act as the trainers mm -hmm. to get those people to learn better. We're learning, we're learning how they learn, which is a really interesting thing from a, a teaching perspective. So we're able to adapt to help them learn better throughout the process. So, so talk to me from a development point of view. How often have you updated what you're delivering or, or changed what people are seeing or, or the feature set that you've built on Bubble yep. in, in relation to what the customers have been giving you in terms of... Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really good question. So, so with the, um, the certification that we built for PS Principles, uh, I'm on what I would call kind of like the third release of that. I think I'm on 3.2. And uh, uh, I think I built two apps before building that app. And even then, I still look at that app and I think it's pretty bad. Um, it, there is, you know, you keep learning, right, in this process. And thankfully, I had the ability to rewrite everything for this app, which is the commercial software that we're offering. Um, this one is actually still on version 1.0. We've made some minor enhancements to things that the customer has asked for, things like some data exporting we added this week and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, just on that, right, we talk about the flexibility that we're after. We didn't have any data exporting because of the, the, the reporting we have is so kind of specific. Mm -hmm. but, but the customer asked for it and we were able to actually create this export data function uh, in two days. And so incredible. essentially, yeah, absolutely incredible. And, you know, I, I'm used to enterprise software, so I gave a very cautious response to the customer. You know, we'll look at it we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Um, but essentially what we're able to do here now is to choose the data type that we want to export. We can actually export the, the date range that is available. We can pick the date range. We can now ex uh, pick the skill that we're going to export for. Now we can export the data out in a matter of seconds and we were able to do that for them. We were able to turn around their, their feature request in a two-day period of time. So now, you, of course, yep, go. When you told them that it would that you were done in two days, right? At the enterprise level, I'm sure that that is literally unheard of. What was their reaction? Yeah, it was pretty good. It, it was, uh, you know, uh, a little short of, of joy and screaming, but it yeah. was, you know, it was, it was actually pretty good, you know. <laughs> the, the fact that uh, all they wanted was a spit out of the data, right? They, they have a BI dashboard that they're trying to create. They've got some executive reporting that they need to do. And they said, look, we, we get this, um, but we need, uh, we just want a raw dump of the data. Yeah. And so we said, yeah, sure. So we created a raw dump of the data. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's for, from their perspective, the fact that it was such a quick turnaround. They had a meeting coming up like before, so they were ecstatic. That's incredible. <laughs> That's great. I'm like I said. I'm sure they've literally never had an experience. Like they're probably anticipating meetings and bringing in developers and scoping and planning and right. and you just like all right, give me a couple of days. Yeah. And <laughs> well, yeah, we try not to. We try not to. 
<laughs> you're like all of us, right? It's all about setting expectations and, yeah. and, and you know trying to uh, under promise and over deliver. But but it, it is about you know I'm always pretty bullish on the things that we can do. There are parts of the application that are insanely complicated, and so we kind of know that, sure. that that's you know we're not gonna we're not gonna change that overnight. The regression testing on it is pretty severe, mm -hmm. uh, but anything that's kind of standalone by itself that we can look at, then then we always are pretty bullish on being able to get it through. You probably should have waited a few more days to let them know it was live, just to get. <laughs> just yeah, that's right. Well, like, the funny thing was, I actually published it before I told them about it, and then we got on a call and uh, they jumped all over it. They were like, "Hey, we got on the the site this morning," and I, and I always love that because that means that they're engaged in the application. So. Mm -hmm. To me, especially from an admin perspective, it's always making sure that somebody cares about the site. Uh, that's really what drives your adoption. And so if nobody's admining and nobody's looking at the site, so the fact that they knew before I got on the call, I was actually, I was pretty stoked at that because it's, it's so much better for them to tell me that they've noticed it than yeah. for me to tell them that it's there. That's a sign of a great product. It's a sign of a successful product. Your users are engaged. They want to use what you've built. They want more. Yeah, there's a lot of rewarding aspects of what we do with this stuff like just getting just reading the skills cards mm -hmm. right just just reading the skills cards and being able to provide that particular person with feedback and you know like i said we've got 116 cities which i think equates to something like 60 countries uh that we're working with at the moment and so not everybody is an english speaker mm -hmm. uh but they're writing in english and they're trying to convey their stories and we keep the stories small we make sure that the stories aren't longer than a certain length uh, and the idea of that is to make sure that people aren't writing, you know, massive essays and then the reviewer has to spend, you know, eight minutes trying to de decipher what's being said. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the tendency for the learners typically is to be a little verbose. And so we try and we, we restrict the character set to make sure that, you know, that, that, that they stay on point. And, uh, you know, it works pretty well. The, the ability to read what they write and the stories they create when they're appreciative for putting the new ideas into practice that's that's the stuff that you walk away from that and just like you know it kind of makes your day so you know th this idea that we've got here of really helping people learn when you actually see it happen it's, it's very it's very fulfilling and so let's talk a little bit about what what's to come what's next yes. for you yeah there's a couple of minor things we want to add but i i think on, on the the big scheme of things and the direction that we're really heading is we really want to get to the point that this becomes a bit of a marketplace Mm -hmm. So what, what we really want to start looking at is, um, you know, like we we're talking about before, how do we start facilitating more products, mm -hmm. training their customers, how to become better at their products, but also how do we bring more content providers? So we, we've got a deal right now with a content provider called CS Pillars, and they're the guys that made the customer success training. That's actually got nothing to do with any of my companies. It's a completely separate company that created the content for this, and they created the content very rapidly in a time frame because we could reuse what they've already got. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we basically have been able to do that, get that live moving quickly. I think the more of those things that we can add, uh, we're actually going to, the way that we're opening up with the platform is we're going to include professional services training, support services training, mm -hmm. and customer success training all as a part of the basic platform fee. And so what uh, essentially within inside of an organization, everybody wants to in the services side anyway, needs to be taking one of those, mm -hmm. but, but we're thinking of just offering that completely as a part of the platform. Those trainings come with the platform and then whatever you want to add to it as a company, you can add at a later date once you've actually been using it. So mm -hmm. I think that's really what, what's next for us is trying to get content providers that want to really kind of use this as a platform, but to also get companies who want to push their training, you know, who are using it to also use it to push their training to their users. I would love to see more technical training on this. And, and you know, if you've ever looked at what Salesforce does with their trailhead, that's probably the pinnacle of the industry from that perspective. Uh, this is a different approach, but you can see that, you know, anybody who doesn't, can't afford to do that or take that approach, this would be uh, a way that they could get that kind of uh, you know, customer facing success up really, really rapidly in a very short period of time. That's exciting. And so I'm going to close out with one last question for you. Sure. What kind of advice would you give to someone who is looking to get started, who's looking to build and wants to build something for enterprise the way you have? Yeah, I, there's, a, there's a couple. I think the first one is to learn how best to control user management. Um, user management is not a centralized function inside a bubble. 
and it's done at a page level. Mm -hmm. Because it's done at a page level, creates all sorts of issues when it comes to trying to build an app. And so one of the core things that we had to work around at the beginning was agreeing a model for user control. And uh, so in the background, we actually have a component that is a reusable element that is called user control. And you'll see here, this is the framework for really the menu bar. So what we did was we centralized the whole control of the app inside the menu bar. And the menu bar is present on every page. Mm -hmm. So now what happens is when you log in, when you get your access, when you look at your profile, it all stems from the menu bar. And what that allows us to do is provided that the menu bar is a placed element on a page, I now have full control over how I deal with this user, mm -hmm. which means that if a user you know, suddenly logs out, they have no access, it helps us look at the privacy rules, it helps us do all the things that stop you having to repeat things, like the menu bar options themselves. Mm -hmm. Creating dynamic menus within Bubble was a real challenge for us at the beginning, especially once you want to make them pretty. If you want to make things that are icon driven, like you see in other applications at an enterprise level, we really had to make sure that there was a way to create a dynamic user control permission based menu set. And one of the things that's great about the menu items that we offer within the Metasphere app is that it is completely data driven and it's completely role and permission based, which is something that, that, you know, it took us a long time to get the right strategy. If I go, like I said before, if I go back and look at my, previous apps mm -hmm. um they were really just you know beta trials that, that some did some didn't work um but but the way that we've got it here we've simplified the data model under the structure i'm a i'm a data driven kind of guy which means i want the data itself to make the decision not the logic and whenever the data can make the decision then let's rely on that and so what we built was a data driven menu user permission and profile type approach that that's definitely one of the first things I would recommend all people to look at. The second is uh, understanding how reuse reusable components can help. It, again, one of the things that, you know, for better or for worse for the way Bubble is set up is that um, maximizing reuse is not obvious sometimes, actually how to do it. And so what happens is you end up doing a lot of literal programming, which, which I hate, right? You, you create <laughs> components that I'm then having to write that same component again somewhere else. Sure. So the whole idea is how do you create that reuse and the combination of this way of using the header as a central spot to store stuff, mm -hmm. uh, even things like global variables that a lot of people ask questions about. You know, it's a lot of people say don't use or do use, but everyone has an opinion on that. But but using that, using reusable groups and then using your um, uh, back-end workflows uh, correctly, that's a thing that you've you got to get that model worked out because once you start duplicating code, your ability to keep your DevOps and to actually keep things maintained becomes really, really difficult. And then the last thing, but, but definitely not uh, the least important is understanding how to get user experience to work in your favor within Bubble is something that takes, you know, you've got to study, you've got to understand what it is. I am not a UX design expert. Uh, in fact, I'd say it's one of the, the least things that I, I know. Well, I'm a, kind of right brain scientific thinker. Uh, and so kind of how to reduce the content on the page and create people a better experience is not where my head goes. Mm -hmm. And so forcing yourself into that and making sure that you're aware of it, you get advice. I think I was listening to one of your other podcasts where that, that topic came up about UX design. It's, it's just critical. And, and, you know, for a lot of things that we do, knowing your own limitations, knowing what your limitations are, and kind of making sure that you get others to help you uh, combat it. And then another thing is, you know, use use the the forums, use the help, use the advice that, of other people. Uh, you know, I did not set out to be a, a, a bubble expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I look at what we've built in comparison to what we kind of show a lot of times. And, uh, you know, through a lot of work, we've managed to present something that, you know, on the grand scheme of things, enterprise organizations look at and are pretty happy with. That's great. I appreciate all that. And those are all very important things. The one thing I'm going to add, because I, that I've taken from everything you said is get your hands dirty. You know, you, you spent a lot of time building to get to where you are now. And so it really sounds like a big takeaway is you've got to just start building, right? Right. Or 
to get comfortable with yeah. office. You're not just going to pick it up in a couple of days. You have to, you know, take the time, build something meaningful, and and you certainly have. This is an incredible piece of software, and I could see why your your clientele loves it. Well, and, and you know, like like you said, now I'm I'm looking forward to the stage where I don't have to do this all the time, and I can actually <laughs> start running the company. Um, but but in order to prove that this stuff was a value, somebody's got to build it, right? And and the thing that I, I got to give Bubble big props for is. You know, if you've got a little bit of mouse and you've got the ability to kind of learn it, you have a tool here that can help you translate your dream into a reality to actually kind of put it down in an app, whether that be, you know, web-based or you want to transition it to, to the mobile platforms. But the whole idea here is you can kind of what we call viability and you, you've talked about MVP on your podcast before, but, but the whole idea here of getting to the first version of what it is you want people to truly use and believe in I, I, you know, it, there's no way we could have done this without Bubble. I mean, for what we're trying to do, you know, we, it would have been, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment to get there. I think I heard you guys say on another thing that it was around 30 grand for MVP. But yeah. for the stuff that the stuff that we're trying to do, you know, it, it's not done cheaply and it's not done easily. So the fact that we're able to do this after, you know, so much time and effort put into the Bubble platform, it's still far cheaper than doing it any other way. But you know, now I get to focus on the business side of it. I yeah. get to like focus on actually running the, the the company, but but we've used it to prove that what we wanted to do is a value to customers, and that's what's important. And, you know, product market fit is the key thing to making any of these things successful. So, you know, thanks to Bubble to really give us the opportunity to make that possible. Yeah, well, well, thank you for doing such a fantastic job and showcasing what really is possible with Bubble. And I'm excited to see what comes next for you. And I'm also excited to see how it goes when you start hiring other developers. Because one of the other things that's nice about Bubble, when you take the time to do things yourself, as you step back, you run the business, you get more customers on board, you can still jump in and take a look at what's going on and you can fix things and you can update colors and you can move around buttons and you can tweak workflows and, and add steps and you can do all those things still if you need to without having to go to a developer and wait several weeks for any kind of feedback, right? Like yeah. something needs to happen right now. You still have a view into how it all works and you understand what you're looking at. Whereas that's yeah, not the case with traditional development. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we've, we're now in the phase with Metasphere where we've got our engineers on board and they're looking at kind of the long-term stack that we're going to use. And, you know, they still look at what we're able to do in this and they're like, geez, it, you know, there's some huge advantages here, even compared to what we would probably traditionally think of as the enterprise stack. And look, you're always going to be able to show architecturally there's probably some benefit in kind of breaking the stack apart and, you know, putting it on this full kind of end-to-end, -end, you know, platform that we're more used to seeing at the enterprise level. But the reality is, is that with that is going to go the flexibility to change things at the rate that we want or our customers are going to want us to change. And, you know, like I've always believed in technology, it's all trade-offs, right? There's, there's nothing that's perfect. Uh, but even now, you know, the, the engineers that we're bringing on, they're, they're saying, geez, you know, what we've been able to produce here and the way that we're able to keep it uh, maintained and the way that we're able to rotate out customer enhancements, it, it's pretty hard to, to beat. Not that there aren't, you know, other ways to kind of look at where benefits come from, but definitely we're, we're finding that, um, you know, that's it, it's hard to compare the, the speed and what you're able to produce in such a short amount of time. Yeah, this is fantastic. And thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate you coming on and showing us everything you've done. Uh, once again, it's Metasphere, M E T I S P H E R E. And I encourage yep. everyone to take a look. Thanks again, Shane. Hey, no problem. And I think uh, just anybody listening, if they want to mention this podcast, we'll offer them 50% uh, off on the use of Metasphere if, uh, for their first year, if they want to uh, try it out and kind of see what, uh, how it works and what all the fuss is about. Uh, but uh, secondly, anybody who's listening to this through kind of like the COVID-19 stuff, if there are skills or retraining and retooling that you need to do, we're happy to actually offer the product for free for a limited amount of time or for a limited number of users to help people get through that crisis. So any kind of opportunity that people have where they have to retool because of either the, the huge move to work from home or because their business model has changed overnight, uh, we want to help out. We want to do what we can. And so if there's any opportunity to do that, just you know, reach out to us, info at metasphere.com. 
and uh, let us know uh, what you need and we'll see if we can help. Great. Thanks. That's incredible. And I hope people take you up on it because this is this is a great platform. And I look like I said, I look forward to seeing how people use it. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thank you all for listening. Be sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on Twitter at Bubble and be sure to tag us when you launch your next no code hustle. There's nothing we love more than seeing you tear down the barrier between real problems and tech enabled solutions all without code.